What's up, Bucks fans? Back here at Pirate Parlay. I'm your host, JC Allen, here on the Sick Podcast Network. Not the outcome that many Bucks fans wanted. The Bucks themselves wanted on New Year's Eve, but they still control their own destiny. Have one game to go. Win and you're in. Uh, Carolina, in Carolina, a team that has been really bad throughout this this NFL season. But, you know, any any given Sunday, anything can happen. The Bucks know they need to be locked in, uh, zoned in to get this win. And we'll talk to one of them today. Uh, find out who it is after the break. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. The Sick Podcast. Pirate Parlay. Battle on the side, the picked off of the end zone. Bucks are going to beat the Chiefs. We're the champions of the world. The sickest Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast. It's going to be sick. It's going to be sick, and we got a sick guest on today. So without further uh, further ado, I won't leave them waiting. Uh, we welcome in Buccaneers cornerback Zion McCollum to the podcast this week. Zion, how are we doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, you, you know, uh, you've taken quite a jump from year one to year two. Uh, it's been really re- remarkable to watch throughout this season. Um, how you feeling? Shoot, I feel good. I mean, body-wise, it's the end of the season, but I'm still chugging along pretty nicely. And it feels good to know that we just need one win to clinch the division. And so my mind right now is just focused on winning. Yeah, you were part of the hat and t-shirt game last year um, at home. Unfortunately, we weren't got a touch on it. Weren't able to get the job done this week to have that hat and t-shirt game at home this week. But as you said, winning your end, control your own destiny. You guys had that opportunity. But what kind of problems were the Saints just kind of presenting you this this past week? Yeah, I thought that they just, I mean, it seemed like they were just more ready, honestly. I mean, from the jump having a long seven, eight minute drive or whatever it was, and then a touchdown and then forcing us to punt early. It seemed like they just showed up ready to attack from the jump. And it seemed as though we just were a little bit lackadaisical, slow, as if we thought that, you know, they were just going to give us the win. But Mm. every win is earned in this league. So, yeah, you know, you look at the the Saints had a padded practice during that week and you guys have been doing more walkthroughs. Uh, facing a physical team like the Saints, do you think you guys might have benefited and in, in, in going in pads for one of those days? Uh, I mean, I can see how some might would think that, but I don't know. Our bodies have been banged up, and we've just been getting guys healthy throughout the week. And so I think taking more of a mental approach was fine. I mean, it's it been working for us, you know what I mean? But, I mean, at the end of the day, you don't know. And, uh, I mean, I personally was physically ready Uh on Sunday. And so we just have to be more tentative and realize that we just have to throw the first punt. All right. Yeah. And you get that opportunity this week at halftime. You know, this is the only game of the season that you guys are kind of down at halftime and, and, and appear to be out of it, right? Only 17 points, anything can happen. But uh, what was the message by Bowles? What was the message by uh, Antoine who stepped up as a leader? What, what are they kind of, uh, we heard from Tristan, the offensive side, but the defensive side, what was the message to you guys at halftime? I mean, it was just to go back to, to the basics and just keep doing what, we, what we've been doing. I mean, it seemed like everything that we were doing was unforced, like, errors in terms of, you know, whether we bust a coverage or, or we miss a tackle here and there. I mean, there was plenty of plays throughout each of their successful drives where we could have gotten off the field and we didn't. So it was just getting back to just taking it one play at a time and just doing our jobs and not trying to do too much. You know, as we mentioned, our you know, and we'll probably mention a few more times, but you control your destiny. You know, that's the biggest thing. When you're in, you finish with a um, you know a positive record. Uh, after a loss like that, it's tough. It, it chews at you. But you know, what was the message um, after the game by Coach Bowles and some of the defensive leaders over there on you know trying to cope on it and move on? You know, we just for. One, we have to learn from every mistake that we made because, I mean, we are doomed to repeat our mistakes if we don't, especially us winning the last four out of five. It's easy for us to just be like, oh, just throw that game away. It doesn't mean anything because we could still win and get in. But, I mean, we had to sit down and really swallow that one up, watch the tape, you know, don't take anything personally, just get better from it and use everything that we get better from uh, this next week. Yeah, uh, talking to Tristan in the, in the locker room afterwards, he, he he said, you know, maybe we needed this. 
you know, maybe guys were, you know, thinking that, as you kind of mentioned, last of days thinking that they could just win the game just by showing up. Do you think that's that's something that maybe you guys needed was, be, you know, with everything still on the line in your, in your hands to kind of, hey, it's the NFL, baby. We're on a hot streak, but stuff like this could happen any minute. Exactly. I mean, it's definitely like a wake-up call. I think we could see it as that. I mean, we lost uh, a lot early which causes us to kind of get that underdog mentality of just, you know, nobody's coming to save us. We have to show up to work every day and go grind as hard as we can. And when you get on a winning streak, you know, a lot of that, you know, it's easy to forget. I mean, you start seeing all the flashy, oh, you know, we, we're going to have to do it. This, this, and that, and this, this, and that. And you kind of lose everything that you once gained when we were losing those games. So I think losing this late and knowing that we can still control our destiny, I mean, we have an opportunity to show up on Sunday and completely wipe that taste out of our mouths completely and focus on the playoffs. So I see it as a benefit for sure. And a home playoff game too. So you're not traveling, you're hosting a team, maybe Philadelphia, could see your brother, maybe Dallas, um, one of those two. <laughs> um, I, I think Devin said we'll, after the loss, we'll see Philadelphia in the playoffs later. So you know, they just lost the to the Cardinals. So, you know, it really is any given Sunday, things can happen. We've seen that the parody throughout the league, the Chiefs. I mean, you just go down the list um, of, of things that can happen. A as far as Carolina, let's talk about them because you played at them already this season. What kind of problems do they present offensively? I know you can look at the numbers. You can look at their record. You can look at their owner throwing drinks on fans. <laughs> <laughs> had to throw that in there, but I mean, you look at all that, and there's still an NF. There's still some of the best football players in the world, but they wouldn't be on the roster. There's only 32 teams, only 53 roster, 53 players on the roster. What do those guys bring to the table that you need to pay attention to on Sunday? Yeah, I mean, they obviously they haven't had the most success, as we all know, but uh, I mean, they have weapons. I mean, like you said, any NFL roster is, you know, 53 best guys that they could find for that given year. And, I mean, Bryce Young has progressed. He hasn't, you know, made as much noise as some of the other rookie quarterbacks like C.J. Stroud or something. But what I've seen from him is just he continues to stay poised amidst all this negativity that's being thrown his way. And he's actually a pretty efficient passer. I mean, he was the first uh, overall pick in the NFL draft. So, I mean, obviously there's talent there that's just raw and he's continuing to iron out those wrinkles. And so I think he gives them a chance at any given game to, to win it. I mean, he is calculated. He's smart. So he's not going to make too much crazy mistakes that he hasn't already learned from. And so and it's a divisional game. So the game planning and the coaching staff wise, I mean, they know us. We know them. So they know all the little you know tendencies that we happen to give off. So. I mean, just like the Saints did really, really well, I thought they game planned us really, really well. The Panthers can game plan us and try to work on term on their terms instead of just having it be a slugfest. Mm. Yeah, and, and, you know, we talked about it earlier, punching them in the mouth first, right? Being the first one, uh, you know, you guys elected to go on defense first and say, hey, we're going to stop them. We're going to punch them in the mouth. Um, you know, the benefits of – uh, you know, doing the deferral to get that possession app after halftime. But you look at a situation with you guys um, on defense, you know, if that does come up again, what do you guys have to do to be ready to deliver that first punch? Maybe not the knockout blow, but maybe make them stagger a little bit. I mean, we just have to fight. I mean, there's an offensive, you know, philosophy called the first 15 where, you know, every the first 15 of an offense is, play calling for any given game day is they're going to try to go off of a script of what they've practiced that, that works against tendencies that shows looks that they don't normally show on film just to kind of throw us off. And I just, you got to be ready to basically defend anything and everything. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you just throw them off, you just create some type of a negative play or some type of a spark play that just kind of grabs the momentum then you can really, really settle in as a defense. And so I think we just have to do a better job of that. Of Within the first five to six plays of the game, so whether it's a big hit, you know, a crazy PBU, you know, something to just get everybody juiced up and, and to get them, you know, minds clicking like, okay, boom, let's move fast. 
All right. And, and for Carolina, this is their last game of the year. You know, you would think that they would have emptied out their playbook. Um, but certainly I know Todd Bowles has, and I know Dave Canales hasn't. There's things that you keep in these situations, these do or die games. And I know the last four or five weeks have almost been like a playoff game every week for you guys, you know, trying to survive and move forward and control that destiny of yours. But you know, Todd's probably got some things in the back pocket to utilize, not only this week, but if you advance, but you know, the, the Panthers, if they haven't emptied out their playbook, emptied out that click, you talk about those first 15, how, cause you're looking, you're, you're doing film study, you're watching everything. How do you react when you see something that maybe you haven't seen them do, or maybe you, you look at, something that's worked against you that another team done that they're trying to, that they're trying to implement to try to take advantage of, of, of that. Yeah. So for one, you have to try to anticipate it, but you have to play a little bit more honest and that's why it's, you know, it's a little hard. A lot of times you want to get the quarterbacks, you know, the quick, easy throws, you know, the dink and dunks because, you know, to get them in a rhythm. And for one, the defense is probably playing a little bit more conservative just because they're trying to see what type of game it's going to be, you know, right. what's the play of the day per se. And, you know, for me, it's just you got to get through, get off the field on that first drive. Because if, if you can get off the field and you knock out the rhythm, then you can talk to your defense and be like, okay, they're about to go back to what they do. They're about to do what they see on film, what we see on film. So just trust it, trust that they're going to go back. But, I mean, if you can't, then it kind of just seems like a whirlwind. And like I said, you just have to try your best to make some type of negative play and just trust that as the game progresses, they will go back to, you know, doing – living off of their own tendencies. Right, right. Definitely makes a lot of sense. Speaking of progression, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of progression from you this year, from year t- year one to year two. Um, coming out of the draft, you had these crazy measurables. You know, I think it was one of the top measurables for any cornerback coming out of the combine. Um, you and uh, I think Tariq Woolen were right up there with size, speed, physicality, everything that you guys brought to the table. It took a little while for you, I think, that first year but as i say every to everyone i talk especially rookies like you guys are going through so much right new city new state new country i mean not new country new coach new you know players new playbook new everything is there's so much going on around you you're in the nfl for the first time that it's it's hard to get up to speed with everything year two is when i think most rookies, then when they make that jump, really start to shine, really start to bring out the best because all they're focused on is they get a full off season. They don't have to train for the underwear Olympics at the combine, you know, non football stuff. They get the full off season and they they're able to really kind of hone in the playbook and and focus on what their job duties and entail in that in that given defense or offense. And you've shown up bright, uh, really in, in big spots all throughout the season. What what about the progression from last year to year two? um in this season has been so big for you yeah i appreciate that and i think just settling in just settling down like you said i mean your first rookie year every rookie handles it differently everybody is seeing everything for the first time and taking it on differently and so for me it was a little bit of chaos i guess in a sense and you know having that injury early didn't help out at all and but I think in the offseason and what Bowles talked to me about, you know, at the end of the year was that, you know, they loved me and they trusted in me. They wanted me to just trust myself and that this offseason was going to be big in terms of the mental growth that I was going to have to take, that I was going to have to step up. I mean, if you don't step up in this league, then obviously we know it's what what happens, you know. Step out. (laughs) Exactly. So, I mean, it it was a little bit of needed pressure. You know, throughout the off season to where, you know, every day, you know, I'm waking up and I'm like, OK, I, I got to get one step closer. I got to get a little bit better uh, because I got people that are depending on me and people that expect me to come back, you know, to OTAs and, and back to training camp ready. And so it, it was definitely big for me taking that mental approach and just completely just learning the playbook in and out of my position and some of the positions around me and being able to meet with Bowles and meet with, you know, Coach Ross It really just help put everything together as we were going into OTAs. And so now I feel like the game has slowed down a ton and uh, I'm able to just play a little bit more free out there. Yeah. And, you know, learn your position, but not just, you know, you look at Carlton, he's usually on the left side, Jamel's on the right side, depending on the way you're looking. If you're lined up on defense, 
Yeah. If you're looking at whatever, <laughs> you guys know what I mean, but you've been bouncing back and forth, you know, due to injuries, you've been playing left side, right side. Do you have a preference? Um, you know, what, what is it like to make that bounce back between those two? You know, I think you've done it in like weeks, like Jamel was out one week and then Carlton was out the next week and you, you bounced from left to right side. Yeah. It's the footwork is definitely different. So at first it's a little bit weird. Uh, but I mean, for me going in as a third corner, I feel like you can't just be tailored to one side right. in particular. You got to be ready for both. And in college, I, I tracked receivers. So I would constantly go back and forth throughout a, a game. So I was kind of used to the mechanics of playing on both sides. And but my favorite side, I mean, I, I feel the most comfortable on the left side, probably. But for right. some odd reason, throughout my entire career, my highlights from high school, college, most of my interceptions and most of my big plays have always happened on the right side. So I say I like the left side more, but I feel like I should like the right side more because it's, it's gotten me the most luck. <laughs> right? You know, you got to go where you go. But exactly, you know, it's funny, you know, in college you track, now you're playing both. But something that you've been asked to do this year, too, is play a little bit inside, too, at nickel. Just what are the challenges of playing the slot um, when you've – you know, you're used to playing the outside and having to move in. As you said, that three corner, he's better be versatile. Um, and you've been playing all three of those spots and, and another one. We'll get into that after. Yeah. Nickel is interesting just because, I mean, I see it as like a, an athletic linebacker per se, a corner linebacker hybrid. So it, it's tough in terms of, you know, you have to be ready to get into the run fits. You have to know gap schemes and the way that offenses are going to trade and attack you in that aspect. And then, uh, it's a little bit better in the past game, in my, in my opinion, just because you're a little bit closer to all your help. As a corner, you know, you kind of feel like you're on an island sometimes, and, and that safety is so far away. But that nickel, right. you got, you know, your linebacker's inside. You got a corner outside, and safety's right there. So you can play a little bit more. You, I think you can cheat a little bit more in, in that aspect, which I kind of enjoy. Anytime I'm going to have an opportunity to cheat, I'm going to try to <laughs> do a little bit of something, you know. But right. uh, I, I like it, too. I enjoy all the positions, really. Well, the other position that you you got a few snaps, game snaps, and uh, against the Jags was safety. So you know you're logging snaps up there too. What was the um, how off, how much cross training has gone on there? Um, and like D Delaney, he he does it all too. How much has he been kind of like a help in saying you know whether it's footwork, whether it's advice, um, just how much cross training, and when did you kind of know that hey I, I might be playing safety in one of these games yeah d delaney he, he does a really good job of making the complicated things seem a little bit simple like he'll, he'll stop me from overthinking a couple of things and times and he's like shoot he did it i did it so why can't you do it you know what i mean right. it's like if you can you have it all in you you just have to get over that mental thing and it was a little bit tough i mean moving to safety just because it's something i've never particularly done I haven't started a game you know in my career in college or anything at safety but I have played the safety position a little bit and I mean as a DB who prides himself on versatility I feel as though I can play any position mm. and luckily I have a twin brother who has played safety his entire life right <laughs> so I mean as soon as I told him that I was probably gonna log some snacks snaps in right there he instantly like took me back to training camp we got on FaceTime and he's breaking me down all the different rules and, and tempos and how, how to do things just because, I mean, anything that I'm going to put myself in, I, mean, I want to try to be the best at it. So he helped me a lot. And then Bowles, obviously, you know, meeting with him and, right. and, and Tim Atkins, it was really, really nice. So, I mean, I love it. The more the merrier. They got the salt and pepper shakers with the ketchup bottle out there showing you where to align it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. X is it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, you, you know, one thing, too, you know, you talked about the slot, you know, having to be ready for run fits um, and, and, and getting involved in the in the run game. And one, one place I think that's, you know, vastly improved for you is, is tackling, um, you know, especially in run support. Um, you know, when you're playing in corner out on an island, you've made some really great tackles this season, just kind of putting some putting some end to the drives. I think, um, you know, just talk about your ability, your your how you've trained um, yourself in that area and how you've become a better tack, short tackler. Yeah, I mean, just in the offseason, Tristan and I, my brother, we go one-on-one -on -one in almost everything. 
you know, receiver DB releases. That's why I said I got a pretty crazy re wide receiver release package. But that's another story. We'll get into that next then. You know, <laughs> he's, he's just uh, he played he he was the running back or whatever, and we just go at it over and over and over and over again. And to make open field tackles, we don't tackle each other to the ground, but uh, ups. you know, we're, we're we're twins, we're brothers. We get a little aggressive with each other. Uh, so you know, just doing being able to do that helped me to the point to where you know I'm not lunging or diving. You know, I can't dive when I don't have pads on. You know, you really got to put your body on people. And it really helped me learn how to use my shoulder a lot more. Instead of ducking my head and going, you know, crown first or, or mm -hmm. feeling like I have to lunge and just take out, you know, knees at, at, on every single tackle. It really helped me to, you know, really use my shoulders and, and deliver blows that way. And the biggest thing is always technique, right? It's technique. Use your shoulder, wrap them up, bring them to the ground. Um, you know, you see way too many players go out there and go for the hit stick or, you know, just go for the shoulder without wrapping them up and, you know, they spin out of it or break out of it. And now it's a, it's a bigger game than it was. And you've been doing a good job at making sure those things don't happen. I've got a pretty intricate question here, um, that I want to get to and, and a follow up afterwards. But, um, this season, the secondary as a whole, you guys have been hurt by that post wheel concept a few times. Pitts has beat you on it. Mingo's beat you on it. Kraft's beat you on it against the Packers. Um, just walk through that. Let me just get my notes up here so I don't want to miss any. Uh, walk through that as an outside corner. Um, when to know how to stay on the outer third and cover three versus when, to, uh, when following to the post. And then just what the underneath defender's assignment is against that wheel. Yeah, so there's different rules and there's different things depending on, you know, the coverage, if it's a three under three deep or a four under three deep or that type of thing. And then it also has something to do with the formation and what the formation is telling you. You know, if you have strength to your side, so, you know, you have three receiving threats to your side, then you know that you're automatically gaining that post safety. So I can let go of that post and stay back for anything that's going to come up out. Uh, but if there's not that, if, you know, you have two receivers and a running back away from you and you just have two threats, then you don't know that safety is probably leaning away from you. So you probably have to take that post and, you know, the underneath is going to have to take their coverage up. But right. so it just depends on the play call of what, you know, we're in, you know, it's, it's partially play call. And then some of those, you know, it's, it's, you know, the players, it's, it's us making the mistake, you know, okay. we us not widening our vision enough or the timing not being correct. But normally with underneath uh, coverage, you, you want to take everything up until you get called off by somebody deeper than you. Uh, and, you know, so we just have to communicate as, as a DB room. A lot of these plays can be easily fixed as long as we just are aware of what one another is going to be doing, what they're thinking, and calling out route concepts and things like that. Do you remember the Tucker Craft one or the Kyle Pitts one? I think those are back-to-back -back weeks. I remember, I remember the one from the Panthers because that was the one that I, that happened to my side. So that was yeah. one that I gave up. I remember the others, but I was on the opposite side, so I don't know exactly, you know, what was going through the heads. Because the Pitts one, I believe the underneath coverage should have carried that up. On yeah. mine with the Panthers, that was on me. I I had three threats to my side. The safety's leaning over. I can stay more outside, and I just lost him in my vision. So th th there's been pretty much every way that you can mess it up. <laughs> you know it's happened and i guess it's a good thing you know as long as you, you don't make the same mistake twice then all right I, shouldn't you be praying for mistakes you know <laughs> <laughs> right it's mistakes are a teaching moment you know, yeah. you, know you, you learn from them no matter what you're doing whether you're, i mean apply it to anything in life you know you right. make a mistake as long as there's obviously some outliers there people but yeah. <laughs> most of the time you can learn from it from a mistake but um you know that's one thing too i mean this this defense phenomenal in the red zone you guys it's almost when they get inside the 30 you're almost like please get please let them get in the red zone please let them get that 10 <laughs> yards because when you do that you, you guys have been pretty locked down right you guys you know holding the field goals or you've had some amazing turnovers in there what has it been about the red zone defense that's been so strong this year for you guys? I think just guys are understanding how to use each other a lot of it, a lot more, you know, 
the field can seem either really, really big or it can seem really, really, really small. And especially in the red zone, you have to be able to use your help and sh- uh, shrink the field as much mm-hmm. as possible. And so I think guys have just been doing a, a lot of that, just trusting, communicating, you know, knowing when to pass things off and knowing when to just stay home. You know, even if you don't have work to your side, are you going to have the discipline to stay home and wait for routes to come your way? Or are you going to go try to search for something? And then, as we know, the quarterbacks in this league are, are really good at extending plays and escaping the pocket. You know, if you could try to do somebody else's job and a quarterback ends up rolling out and slipping off of a tackle, it could mean somebody's wide open. So I thought I think guys have been doing a really, really good job of just staying home and just trusting it. You talk about the shrinkage of the field, and I think I look at that, too, as one of the big reasons why you guys had so much success down there. Um, Because on the flip side, when teams are starting, let's just say from the 25 after a a kickoff, you guys have let up quite a few explosive plays. Um, And I think I'm being generous there, but there's been a lot of explosive plays down the field. Um, You look at the yards against, you guys are way up there at at the bottom of the league. What has it been? Has it, and, and like, I'm not going to try to make excuses for you, but there's been a lot of injuries, right? New players, young players, um, you know, you've been switching sides a lot. Um, it, has it been um, just there's not been a co- cohesive unit back there all season long because of injuries, because of inexperience, because of new additions to the team? What what has it been that there's been so many of these explosive plays given up uh, by the secondary? Yeah, I mean – You know, I want to take the easy road and just say, oh, yeah, we haven't had the same group in there. But I don't think that that has anything to do with it, honestly. I mean, we're all in the meetings together. We all practice together. So to me, all the DBs is like one big family. You know, we should all be on the same page and no matter what's happening. So, I mean, I think it could be a little bit of conservativity, you know, in in players and just wanting to, you know, when you go out there and, and you're playing a game, you don't get plays back. You know, if you give up a pass, a 10-yard pass here, a 15-yard pass here, you know, that starts to add up. And so I think people just developing a mindset to where you're on attack mode, attack mode, attack mode all the time can, you know, give up for some of that. But, I mean, also, you know, there are plays and schemes that have just, you know, worked against us. And some of those that we live with, if we end up getting off the field, I mean, of course, <laughs> if you get off the field, you right. get off the field. but, I mean, it doesn't hurt you until it hurts you. And so... I think it's just been a little bit of everything, you know, going through a season, there's so many different moving parts and so many different things, uh, as you said, different lineups and, and different game plans. And so I think it's just been a little bit of everything, not necessarily one particular thing. All right, and they're getting paid too. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, um, but one thing that, uh, you know, you kind of look at the film and notice is, you know, you guys have been playing a lot of different concepts um, as far as coverage concepts and, after being kind of more aggressive, playing a little bit more, you know, press man and man coverage the last four weeks during that win streak, it looks like, you know, Bulls kind of fell back into that soft zone coverage that you guys were playing this past week. And they seem to have success. And, and when you guys were going through the, the losing streak, it seemed like that soft zone coverage was, you know, allowing teams to have success. Do you feel comfortable in that soft zone coverage or do you prefer playing, you know, man, man zone um, what, what's your preferred coverage? And do you think that coverages can, can factor in, um, you know, a team's ability to win or lose a game? For 100% coverages can have something to do with winning and losing a game. You know, you have to be able to be flexible and to know, you know, the game is changing constantly. It's a chess match between, you know, DC and OC um, respective sides. So you have to be able to understand trends and, and go and roll with the punches. And so to me personally, I mean, I, I enjoy man to man, but I also enjoy, you know, the soft zones because in a lot of those you have eyes on the quarterback. You can make plays on other people's, you know, receivers and, and you can intercept the quarterback a lot better and a lot more in those type of things. But it really just depends on the, the offensive scheme that we're facing for the week. A lot of those soft zones, they don't work if you can't disguise the right way. So take me through the Saints this past week. Yeah, so the Saints, they did a really good job of of getting on the ball, snapping it quick. You know, they do their motion. It's nothing really cute, but they don't allow you to be able to show your disguise. Then you have to show your hand. 
And so I thought they did a really good job, Derek Carr did, of managing the game in that way, uh, of not taking his time, you know, with the play clock in certain situations, uh, you know, seeing what we're in and trying to snap the ball quickly. And it's kind of forcing our hands. Our safeties have to rotate down or our corners that are showing like they're pressed, you know, they have to get off a little bit quicker or they're playing off. They have to show that they're pressing a little bit sooner. So I think being able to work on a tightrope, understanding that if an offense is not going to let us hold a disguise, then, you know, we're going to have to take chances, you know, and, and disguise in more creative ways. Wow. That's great insight. That's some great insight right there. Um, I've got a couple more and then we'll get into the fun stuff. Um, just want to, you know, we talked about you being a, being thrust into games, right? Carlton goes down two weeks ago. You're thrust back into the game. It's happened with Jamel. It's happened multiple times. It's happened for a few plays and they come back in and you're back in. How do you stay mentally prepared? How do you stay mentally ready when you don't, you know, when you're getting thrown into a game mid game, you know, being pulled, but then thrown back out there if they test it out and they can't go. So how do you just stay mentally prepared through all that, throughout all that? Yeah. I mean, just, you gotta be locked in really. Uh, you have to really anticipate the worst happening on any given Sunday. So for me, I mean, last year I put myself in harm's way a couple of times when oh, I'm all I'm doing is playing special teams and then boom, two plays, two people go down and I'm in. And that feeling of being in the game when you really have no idea what's going on is <laughs> gotta be one of the worst feelings you could feel. Uh, and so, you know, as a third corner, I'm just gonna prepare as if I'm starting, even when I'm not starting. It gets a little bit tougher when, you know, you're focusing on, you know, a nickel or safety and, you know, you're watching film only on the slot or only reading, you know, the box and the quarterback. And then you go out at corner and it's like, OK, dang, I've been watching film or <laughs> as much outside as I have been trying to focus inside. So that's where you can kind of get into trouble a little bit. But as of recently, I've just been kind of just study everything and just be ready for everything. I got a good system throughout the week uh, of being prepared for everything. So it's been working. Take me, take me through that system a little bit. What, what it? Tuesday's your day off. You come in on Wednesday. What's, what's that look like throughout game week? Yeah, I mean Tuesday is the day off, and, but I like to get a jump, a head start on my opponent. Just learning about, you know, first and second down passing. You know what we're going to be going into on Wednesday, and when I'm at the facility, you know, I get my physical therapy and everything. But you know, when I'm eating, I try to be in the film room, and just you know, breaking everything down by formation and not necessarily memorizing playbooks, but I mean, memorizing playbooks at the same time, just trying to pick up on all the little things. And something I learned from college was, you know, you can watch a ton of film and a ton of film and not kind of understand anything, but it just takes like that one extra play or them, those five extra minutes where you kind of start to see the smallest of details, you know, this guy's right foot up is, is up on this particular play. Uh, they do this same motion in this particular play. You know, the running back looks like personnel, you know, all type of stuff. And so every single day leading up to game day, you know, I, I make sure to get at least probably two hours outside of uh, the facility of just strictly film study. That's awesome. Yeah, you got to be prepared, right? Mentally prepared. Um, no matter where you're at coming in, you can't just be lackadaisical on the sideline like, well, I'm not playing, you know. Um, you got to be asking those questions with guys like Jamel and, and Carlton, especially if they're in the game ahead of you, seeing what they're seeing. So when you do get your number called, you're not going in there like, okay, I don't know what they've been running all game uh, because I haven't been paying attention. <laughs> so, um, but with with guys like Jamel and Carlton, obviously they've you know two of the top corners in the in the game. Um, can you just talk about specifically what they've done and to, to help your growth, like you know individually? So like, what have what is you know Jamel's one of the best press man covers corners in the game. Um, you know, Carlton's really good in zone coverage, um, but also really good in man coverage, you know. Um, what have they, what have you taken from them? What have they given you? What have they kind of helped you out with? Yeah, they both have helped me out, you know, a ton in OTAs and through training camp and, and throughout the year too. You know, Jamel, he's really, really smart. So, I mean, he's helped me with picking up certain things and, and what to watch in film. But also just kind of understand, like, he broke it down to me, plain and simple. He's like, everything slows down once you see everything. And I've been in the league for four years now. Last year, he told me, you know, for three years, I've pretty much seen every play that can be run. So mm -hmm. the game starts to slow down. And so that really just inspired me to be like, okay, look, I just need to watch more film. And then right. things are going to start clicking. I just have to trust that that's going to happen. And 
when it did, then it's like, okay, Jamel, I appreciate it. Like, let's <laughs> talk ball now. Like, now that I've tried to rise myself to to your level in terms of your knowledge of the game, like, let's really like talk routes, let's talk concepts and stuff like that. And Carlton, he's really helped me uh, in just my physical development and my technique and just understanding how to play certain situations and and. So especially in zone coverage, he, he's helped me expand my vision and just know, you know, things are moving moving fast out there, but you have to be able to to know where you are on the field and uh, and trust your own ability, trust your speed to be able to open up while being patient enough to react to other things. And and, and press coverage, it's all about, you know, the feet. He, he's helped me with my feet and, and moving everything. And so them helping me has is, is really been, been an awesome thing. You got that mental, mental and physical from both of them. And, you know, as a veteran now yourself, you got another young guy come in. He's the, he's the guy at nickel, um, a couple other guys in, uh, Derek and, and Keenan, uh, what has it been like? What, what advice have you given Christian, uh, in that starting, is he in that starting role? And then same thing with, with Keenan and, uh, and, um, Derek. Yeah, I think as a rookie, it's really hard to know what to focus on. So I've just been, you know, trying to help them, you know, know what to focus on, you know, things that may be upsetting you, you know, don't see that as an upsetting thing. You know, if a coach is getting on you, you know, they really, really care. You know, they want to see the best out of you. Like, don't get, you know, this mental, you know, prison, put yourself in mm -hmm. and think that because to me, it's all energy. It's like you have to keep your energy up. You got to be positive. You got to stay up, especially on the field, because. If they can sense the opposing team can sense that you, you know you're down, then uh, they call that the Where's Waldo? Like <laughs> find Waldo and just keep attacking him over and over and over again until he he pulls himself out. So I've just been trying to help them understand you know the mental toughness in terms of you got to know what to focus on and, and what to go in one ear and out the other. That's that's awesome. That's great advice too. You know, there's that goldfish mentality, that ability to kind of just leave things. Bad plays, bad moments, whether it's in games, whether it's in, in installs, whether it's in walkthroughs, you know, that shit's going to happen. <laughs> it's part of the game. You know, you're going to have bad plays. You're going to have bad moments. Coach is going to have bad calls. It's, it's, it's part of the game. You can't win everything or else every year there'd be undefeated teams, you know. It's just, it hasn't been one since 1972 for a reason. Football's hard. It's not as easy as Madden thinks it is and as fans think it is, right? Just go out there and do this. Why aren't you doing that? Well, because they're doing this. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I try to get my, my fans to understand that a little bit. But, uh, you know, what can you do? Fans are short for fanatic, and they are fanatical. So, um, as far as being a fan, though, you've, you're a fan yourself. You've, you've had to be a fan of yourself of the game. That's why you love it. That's why you play it. Um, and I'm sure as a, as a defensive back, there's someone that you grew up watching, admiring, and that you've, you know, taken parts of their game, um, and molded it into your game. So who's been that role model? Who's been the guy that you've kind of modeled your game after, uh, similar attributes and everything like that, that you're like, if I can get my game to this level, obviously be your own person, but who's that, who's been that guy for you? Yeah. Growing up and pretty much up until I got here has been Jarrell Rivas. I mean, I fell in love with his tape, watching it. I used to watch his practice film and me and my brother would watch it on YouTube and it'd be like hour long videos of just silent, just his practice film, like just him running one-on-ones or doing a particular drill and stuff. And so I used to love the way that he played the game. And I just, I admired how sticky he was. Like he, he wasn't out there doing, you know, the exact same technique for every single player that he, Faced. He was able to be adaptive, and, and at the end of the day, if you're sticking on receivers, you know it doesn't really matter. So, yeah, he was he was incredible. Watch former Buccaneer, you know, too yeah, as well. I agree. Uh, so, uh, just went into the hall last year, which is great. So, I'm assuming the next question is who are your top three corners of all time. I'm assuming the rails up there for you. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I say Jarrell Revis, big time, obviously prime was athletically you know gifted and i admire that because i like to think of myself as athletically gifted so to see somebody use their athleticism in ways the way that he did you know that's big props and then 
Uh, let's see. I guess I should do a young one. I mean, Jalen Ramsey, uh, when he was young and he first got into the league and he played for Jacksonville, he just brought a different energy. I felt like yeah. that the uh, corner position I hadn't seen in, in a little bit, you know, that nastiness, that dog mentality. And seeing him in person for the first time last year, I didn't know he was that tall either. Like, <laughs> he's a big corner, and he's faster than I thought. And so he, he's an athletic freak, too. And so I think he, he's got to be in my top three. All right, who, who are your top five current DB, uh, cornerbacks right now in the league? Top five current. Okay. Excluding Bucks. Excluding Bucks. Excluding Bucks. Because oh, I don't want you to give me the, oh, Jamel and oh, Carlton, which they are, I think, top corners in the league. I wouldn't know if I'd put them top five, and I'll tell them that to, in, in, at, at practice on Thursday when I'm down there. But I think they, they're definitely top 10, top 15, but I don't want you to give me that generic answer. Oh, my gosh, is the best. So give me a top five excluding Bucks. Yeah, I'll say Jalen Ramsey. Yeah. Is a, and I won't say in any particular order okay. for sure. Uh, but definitely Jalen Ramsey. Pastor Tane, I've been watching his tape for a long time. Uh, he, he's a quiet, a little bit more quiet, but he does a lot of dirty work. And, and so I definitely got to say him. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Corners. Have, Cause I've been watching a lot of tapes. So, you know, I've seen a lot. I mean, I feel like for this year, I got to say, say bland, Jer Jerome bland. I mean, anytime you're catching interceptions like that, you know, despite what else is happening, you're living right. You're doing something right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Xavier Howard has been okay. in the game a ton. Uh, ever since he had that 10 interception season, he's been lighting it up. So I'll say him. And let me think of another. Let me think. Let me, let me get somebody. Let me try to get somebody young in there. You got sauce. Uh, there's sauce. I mean, sauce is, I think sauce is talented. Yeah, I think he, he reminds me of CD a, a little bit in terms okay. of just being able to just be raw, a little bit more raw. Uh, in terms of his technique, yeah, uh, spell draft mate. Uh, the woolen, woolen. I like wool. I mean, I like Reek. Reek, Reek is a freak too. I like uh, Witherspoon though. I've been seeing his tape, and he's been flashing. He goes inside and outside, so I respect that. And so I got to give love, a, love, a little bit of love for my my young guys too. I'll say. Yeah, yeah. He's he's been really coming on. Christian Gonzalez was really lighting it up too before he got injured and fortunately. Yeah. But last year, two two really good. Good cornerback groups. If you weren't a cornerback, though, what position on the football field would you would be playing? Uh, I want to say receiver. Yeah? But people are going to be like, oh, you need to start catching everything that touches your hands before that. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I'd like to say receiver. Just my athleticism and everything and speed, quickness. I feel like I can make a DB have problems at the line. <laughs> so why did why did you pick corner over deep over over offense? When I was in high school and we were picking out our positions and everything, going into my sophomore year, uh, for my freshman year, I played both sides, and I did great at as probably better at receiver than I did at DB. But uh, coach pulled me and my brother aside when we went out to the offense uh, my sophomore year, and he was like, "Look, you might hate me now, but you're playing on defense." Because that's the only way you're going to the NFL is on defense. <laughs> you pretty much said you guys are great route runners. You're super fast, but you don't have any hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably the nice way of letting me know. Like, look, you got a ton of athleticism. I, we got to use you on defense. So. <laughs> it worked out. It worked out. It worked out. I know. I thank him for it. I mean, I love it. <laughs> Uh, you you know, with that speed athleticism, I know you you're you're you play gunner and you're and you're, you excel at it, but. Have you been in, in, in maybe Armstrong or Bulls here? Say, hey, let me get a couple reps on uh, as front returner. Let me get a little bit. Uh, of I could do. I think I could do some a little crazy at front returner and kickoff returner. I mean, me, I'm a guy who doesn't really shy away from contact. So I haven't I even seen you back there. I don't think during like training camp or anything like that. Yeah, no, I haven't. It's not necessarily been in my pinwheel in, in my career. But I mean, like I said, anything that I'm doing, I love doing new things. 
And I mean, if I touch that that football, I gotta I gotta get to the paint. So <laughs> I, I was just... for next year. Definitely. Look that <laughs> know, let me start leaving hints. Uh, <laughs> hints now. <laughs> just cut a highlight reel with your brother in the off season. Look what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, this next segment, and then we'll finish up here, is rapid fire. It's called This or That and Favorites. So I'm going to give you two options, and I'm going to ask you your favorites. It's just going to be rapid fire. First thing that comes to your mind, um, and then uh, we'll move on and, and get you on out of here. So this or that, first thing is Xbox or PlayStation? PlayStation. What are you playing? Uh, Right now, I don't even have a PlayStation right now. I do have a switch though. My PlayStation is back at the house. When I was playing PlayStation, my favorite games were Call of Duty, FIFA. I'm a big zombies guy on Call of Duty too. Black Ops 2 is probably my all time favorite game on, on PlayStation. Uh, what are you playing on the Switch? On the Switch, I've been playing a lot of Mario Kart. I got the new Super Mario Bros. Uh, uh -huh. I've been playing Brawlhalla. Gotcha. Uh, little Zelda, little Pokemon. Uh, Zelda when I when I was uh younger that was really my brother's game my brother loved Legend yeah. of Zelda and okay. Pokemon oh yeah we were big Pokemon fans growing up <laughs> cool uh, Beach of the Mountains I'm from Galveston so I have to say beach I have bias all right Just, and come to another beach town so <laughs> exactly so Tampa it feels like home but mountains I mean the Rocky Mountains are absolutely gorgeous and so I wouldn't be upset with either honestly. Um, Marvel or DC? I'm not the biggest superhero, but my fiance has been watching, keeping track of watching every Marvel movie from start to finish. I don't know. All it's the like shows 50, too? 50. I don't know if she included. Actually, no, she didn't include the shows. It's like in chronological order, <laughs> super fan style. That's and awesome. I mean, I enjoy, enjoy those movies. Uh, so I'd say Marvel. Uh, my favorite, favorite movie so far has probably been... The Guardians of the Galaxy segment. Those movies are hilarious. Yeah, they're great. Those are great. Those are probably some of the funniest movies in the whole thing. Who's your favorite hero? Favorite hero? Hmm. Man, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, I'll just choose from the from the Avengers. I'll say Spider Man. Probably. I think he's the most relatable. Uh, for you know everybody is coming from the background that he did and being so young and forced to do everything that he did. Uh, yeah, definitely. I got to get my props. Spider-Man's a great answer. You know, I've yet to have anyone on the team say DC. Everyone's Marvel fans, pretty much. <laughs> right. yeah, I love it. Um, city or country? City or country? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, would you rather, like, be a city, like, in the city? Oh. A nice guy's or, or rather, like, in the country, in the sticks, chilling, riding quads? Oh, country, for sure. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, coming from Texas, my both sides of my family. My mom's side is from the country in Texas, and my dad uh, side is from the country in Arkansas. So I love the woods and just being separated from everything. You can see the stars, too, so that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> got a pretty clear night on New Year's, which was nice, but still, you can't see them like you can see them when you're – out there or in the mountains or anything. Yeah, I miss that about uh, up north for sure. Uh, movie or TV series? I say TV series. What have you been watching? I've been watching a lot of like more reality based TV uh, TV series. So currently, I'm watching Hell's Kitchen and The Challenge. Uh, I watched Survivor just ended, Big Brother, and then they nice. had like a little spinoff. So kind of those type of shows. Uh, that what the MTV Challenge? Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I'm pretty good friends with CT from when I lived up north. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a he's a he's a pretty chill guy. Um, but yeah, he's 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 a little bit of a party animal when we were hanging out. But um, <laughs> what? He seems like wild, you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. He's 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 definitely definitely a little wild. I'll share <laughs> some stories in the locker room when I see him. <laughs> Not fit for TV. <laughs> uh, favorite movie. Ah, oh, favorite movie. I mean, the first movie that popped up in my head for some reason is Happy Gilmore. Great one. Because my brother and I used to watch that movie so much. But I like all types of movies. I like the Shrek trilogy. Interstellar was really good. Awesome. I'm more, I'm more I like comedies and then like the thriller uh, yeah. kind of movies. Uh, a little bit of horror, but I think I like more on like the thriller side of things. 
I think uh, who was it? Cody Moak. Uh, he, I had him on. He had just watched Interstellar for the first time, and I think uh, JTS had just watched Interstellar for the first time not too long ago. I want to have him on. That was that was their answer uh, for for recent <laughs> really? watch. Good, great one, so yeah. Um, favorite sports team growing up? The Eagles, oh. undoubtedly. Okay. I know, I know, I know. It's a little weird now. <laughs> right now, my favorite team is the Bucks. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I don't, right. right you can't help it, right? I mean, you can't right. help it. I mean, that's why it's so crazy that Tristan plays for them now. I mean, right. Like, the draft was his favorite team, the Eagles, too. Yeah, so his favorite team actually was the Eagles before it was my favorite team. I started out as like a Bears fan when I was like in elementary school, and you realized you know you knew better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was fun, you know, cheering on with Tristan too for games, and you know, at, at that age, it was like whatever. You know, team has the best colors and logos. It's right, the team that you're gravitating towards, and so right. it was easy. when when I was a kid, Charlotte Hornets were like, you know, I like the Celtics. Yeah. <laughs> Charlotte Hornets had that color, the, like the starter jackets. Like, you're like, yeah, that's a bad team, you know. So that was a team you liked. Uh, what's the favorite place you ever visited? Favorite place, the most fun I've ever had was at Crested Butte in Colorado, uh, going skiing there. Uh, been skiing there twice now and it's like incredible amazing and the views that's why i said the mountains like i wouldn't be upset being in there because the rocky mountains are, are gorgeous okay A any uh trips planned out for this uh off season no i'm just getting married march 23rd back in texas and so that's the big kind of thing and uh We'll be having like the bachelor bachelorette parties uh, close to Tampa, so it'll be fun getting a lot of my friends out here that haven't been out here yet. And then uh, nothing big planned, but we we want to probably do something, maybe like a little low key, like get a log cabin in Oklahoma or something. Something that's chill. awesome. That's awesome. I want to I want to do that with my kids up in the mountains, up in Georgia. It's not too far for like a car ride for them, and uh, yeah, they've never seen snow. Or at least they don't remember it. So I want right. to. Oh, and not that, like, it's good for like a weekend and then I get the hell out of there. <laughs> get back to the heat. <laughs> right. What's your favorite food? Any, any style of Mexican food. Yeah. I'll say, I mean, enchiladas, love enchiladas, tacos, burritos, chalupas, uh, yeah. any type. Being in yeah, Texas, that was my mom's favorite growing up. And so. You got to adapt to the, the Cuban side over here, you know? There's still a few good Mexican joints down here. Yeah, um, yeah, there is. Uh, Needles in the haystack, but that was yeah. a weird transition. I was like, "Where's all the Mexican food?" And like Mexican food, Cuban food. Cuban food. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, give, give me a Cuban sandwich. And it's not the same, but it'll do, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite cereal? Cereal, cinnamon toast crunch. Yeah, go to easy, easy yeah. one. The milk. Um, oh. uh, the favorite game you ever watched? Any sports game? Any sports game. It was. I mean, it was always fun watching Usain Bolt compete in the Olympics. Uh, but if I'm saying game, game, hmm. I guess because I'm an Eagles fan, uh, seeing the Eagles win that Super Bowl in 2017 was pretty, pretty awesome. And it was crazy just how that whole playoffs went, the way that the Vikings won, beat the Saints uh, on that last play, and then them going on with the Philly special versus, yeah, it was, that was pretty special. I like that answer. I like that <laughs> I'm answer. sorry. I'm being I don't like that answer. You, you know, you know why? I mean, oh, I did not. I don't like that. that answer. But you know what? They're one and one against each other. You know. Yeah, right? exactly. They just got got them back. You know, but the thing is, you know, the past quarterback didn't throw up in the Super Bowl, so they still got that check. Yeah. <laughs> <Donald McNabbit. laughs> uh, what's your favorite color? Uh, red. Uh, favorite TV show. Ooh, you must have been happy to see the Reds back. We're like, <laughs> you guys took so long to bring those red jerseys out. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. I was waiting every week. You know, I, I see early on and I kept seeing white and white and white. And I'm like, are we going to do it? I thought we were red and pewter, not a white and pewter. <laughs> All right. Oh, the white cause the heat makes so much sense. Right. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Especially like, I remember then, like Chicago. It started to cool down. You're like, why is it still white? <laughs> it's 70 <laughs> out this week. It's not 90. We're used to the heat by now. <laughs> uh, TV show. I yeah. mean, like I said, I like 
the the reality based TV shows a lot. I mean, but also I like animated TV shows, uh, Rick and Morty, mm -hmm. Solar Opposites, uh, Family Guy, American Dad, a lot of those oh, comedy, co comedic TV shows. Yeah. You watched the, that that Love Is Blind show? Yeah. I'm I my wife started watching it and I was like, she's gonna watch this with me. I'm like, no, I'm just sitting there like kind of like scrolling, playing on my phone, writing an article or whatever. And I look up and I'm like, what the fuck? What is this? And then like <laughs> I'm like, now I'm glued in, and now like I'm over there like just kind of like cheesing, laughing, like cheesing at the show. Like this is this is so crazy. The concept's so crazy. And she's like, oh, look who's cheesing now. I was like, whatever. Like <laughs> that's exactly how I started out. Like I yeah. never watched reality TV show except for like things like Survivor. Uh, Survivor Big Brother, like, I watched it. You know, yeah, but it. shows like that never until I just kept seeing myself. <laughs> look up more and more and it's like okay i'm not what do you mean he's not gonna tell <laughs> that and the, the ultimatum one's crazy too that's that, not that was, well i i'm telling you all all the shows those are crazy <laughs> i i can't I'll, yeah go sleep with this dude for a week then come back and live with me for a week and let's yeah, see like, like, what awesome. you can't make this stuff up <laughs> what and these people sign up for it. anyways we're getting off the rails here <laughs> what's your favorite sports memory uh, winning the national championship in 2020 at Sam Houston. 100%. Can't, can't write the script any better than that. No, you can't. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite dessert? Favorite dessert, ice cream, specifically sweet cream ice cream. Okay. Uh, with strawberries or Oreos. And then I've also been starting to throw yellow cake in there too. So can't big marble slab guy. Yeah. <laughs> can't go wrong with the yellow cake. Um, What's it? What's your favorite season of the year? Spring. Birthdays in May and then spring. You know, you're just now starting to get that warm weather. Everything's starting to bloom again. Good vibes. Absolutely. Um, favorite player growing up? I think we've got that. Revis? Yeah, Darrell Revis for sure. Uh, favorite game you played in? Favorite game with the books or? Uh, Any game. Uh, the semifinal game of that national championship run versus James Madison was probably the most fun game to be a part of just because we were down, we were down like 27 points or so at halftime and ended up coming back halfway in the third quarter and retook the lead and won that game. It was crazy, like crazy. It was some type of magic in the air or something. It was wild. <laughs> The, the roller coaster of emotions to exactly. and come out on top. You're just mentally and exhausted, physically exhausted. You're standing there with the dub. That's got to be a great feeling for sure. Um, that's going to do it. That's everything I got, man. I uh, appreciate all the time you're giving me today. I uh, just want to leave you with the floor. Um, any messages you got for Bucks fans? Anything, you know, promotions you got going on? Uh, anything you want to want to tell them? The floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have too much to say. I mean, I love love y'all 100%, and I appreciate the support and you sticking with me throughout, you know, the journey and the ups and the downs, and I'm going to continue to give 110, 200% of myself each and every day to get better and better and become the player that, that I want to become and that y'all want me to become. And just know this week is a big week. We're taking it super serious. We're locking in, locking down. We don't take any opponent for, for granted, and, Bucks fans, we're going to go get into these playoffs. Woo! Woo! There you go. There's a message from you, from your Buccaneers cornerback, Zion McCollum. Zion, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I'll see you later this week. And uh, um, thank you again, man. Uh, great stuff. Great stuff. Great information. Great insight. And, and it was good, great to get to know you a little bit more, too, you know, besides football. So thank you again so much for your time. Of course. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. You guys have it. Another episode of Pirate Parley in the books. Zion McCollum, another player. Uh, great stuff, great information, great insight, and great to get to know him too. So that's going to do it this week for another episode of the Pirate Parlay podcast. I'm JC Allen here at the Sick Podcast Network. And we'll see you guys later. Out. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast Pirate Parlay on YouTube, Facebook. Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.